ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930 present The Drive. It is Wednesday, July 20th. Your drive begins now on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. I'm your host, Paul Swan. Thanks for tuning in. We are here until 6 o'clock this evening. We will get your phone calls in this hour, 877-420-TALK, 877-420-8255. Text line is open for you as well, 304-396-TALK. That's 304-396-8255. Coming up this hour, we're going to talk a little Sunbelt football. We have got, usually on Wednesdays, we talk to Lindsey Webb from the Charleston Dirty Birds. We're still going to talk to her, but she's a little bit later on in the show because we want to welcome in the next few minutes the play-by-play voice of Georgia State, Dave Cohen. He is going to be with us, and we're going to talk about Georgia State. They finished strong 8-5 and five record. This might be one of the teams that you want to watch out for in the Sun Belt. You look at what they did last season, and again, we're talking a new season here, but – you really can't judge this team by its early losses. Yeah, it, okay, the the loss to Army, 43-10. Yeah, it, Army got them. Army just got them. And then they lose at North Carolina, 59-17. Okay, North Carolina got them. They beat Charlotte 20-9. We know about Charlotte. And then they go and lose at Auburn. 34-24, you're thinking, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here. Is this the same team that lost 59-17 in North Carolina? And, okay, Appy gets them, but Appy gets a lot of people. Appy gets a lot of people. But pretty much after that, with the exception of Louisiana, and we know how tough Louisiana was last year, Georgia State handled its business. You know, wins at Louisiana Monroe, at Georgia Southern. They love that one. At Coastal Carolina, beat home Texas State, Arkansas State, and Troy, and won its bowl game against Ball State 51-20. So this team has got a lot coming back. Also, a couple of names on the Maxwell Award list we're going to be talking about throughout the Sun Belt and and throughout the the weeks here. We're kind of keeping an eye on it. Another list that came out today, and there are a couple of Georgia State players on it, was the Doak Walker Award. So that's out today. Rasheen Ali is on it, as he should be. So he's on the Maxwell. He's also now on the Doak Walker. And there are a couple other players that were named to the Doak Walker watch list, the preseason list today. And that's Tucker Gregg and Jameis Williams. So Georgia State has got a couple of players to watch out for. What's this team about as far as rushing? Well, averaged almost 230 yards a game last season, and that put them in the top 10 as far as rushing is concerned. So this is a good team, or this was a good team last year in so many respects. And so you look at this team and you think, okay, uh, is there going to be enough footballs? Is there going to be enough football? So um, the answer is, Maybe. Maybe. We'll find out. So we're going to talk here in the next few minutes to the play-by-play voice of Georgia State, Dave Cohen. So I'm looking forward to catching up with him and uh, kind of getting a feel for what this team is all about. I mean, I think this is going to be one of the better teams in the Sun Belt. I don't think this is going to be a team that has a a drop-off. And really, I'm trying to find wins here. I'm looking at the schedule for Marshall. I'm trying to find wins. That's going to be – because you can't just say, oh, this is going to be easy. It's not. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be fun. It's going to be competitive. But Louisiana is going to be tough. I think James Madison is going to be tough. Coastal, Old Dominion, App State, obviously. Georgia Southern, Georgia State. Yeah, this is going to be – this is going to be the black and blue division of the Sun Belt. I know conferences are getting away from divisions, not here in the Sun Belt. They relish them, and this is going to be the black and blue division here in the Sun Belt. And you get to end the regular season against Georgia State. So how cool is that? You get some really bangers early on. You get Louisiana. You get Coastal. You get App in November. 
and I love the the final weeks because App State, Georgia Southern, and then you get Georgia State, and you know you don't have a rivalry with them just yet. We'll find out. We'll find out how quick the rivalry begins because I think already you got that little little spice there with Louisiana. It's a little spicy right now, so I think that's going to flare up into something good. And of course, you have Old Dominion, so you know carry over from from Conference USA. That's going to carry over and. I don't think you need to reunite anything. Marshall App State, that's there. That's that's good. That's golden. And I think Marshall and Georgia Southern, that'll flare back up. So that's going to be good as well. Georgia State, how are we going to feel about that? I'm interested. That that piques my interest here. I like that I'm a fan of the Sun Belt schedule. I'm a fan of the Sun Belt schedule. And you know what? I don't have an issue with Norfolk State on the schedule. I just want to go ahead and re, uh, reaffirm that. You might. I don't. It's an opportunity for the herd to play football. Because after that, you're going to Notre Dame, and Bowling Green is not terrible by any stretch of the imagination, and then you got to go to Troy. So you're not going to see the herd for a while. It's all right. It's, it's okay. Leading off with Norfolk State is not terrible. Let's turn our attention to last night's all-star game. I, I said on the program, and I meant it, that the National League would win. Better luck next year. 3-2, you know why? Because the American League hit homers. Giancarlo Stanton, two-run homer for the American League, and he was named the MVP as well. Third Yankees player to win MVP of the all-star game. Uh, you follow that up with a home run, which was the winner. Byron Buxton hit the homer that was the winner, and it was the seventh time in All-Star Game history that back-to-back home runs have been hit, and it's the first time since 2018. So, entertaining game. The Midsummer Classic last night at Dodger Stadium felt like baseball because Dodger Stadium is not a new stadium, but it feels like it is a new stadium it's a classic new stadium it just feels it feels classic it feels good hopefully it's going to be a a shorter shorter distance between all-star games at dodger stadium i mean i get it you want to you want to spread the love around at the same time you want to go to a a venue that's actually good for the game and i think you gotta go i mean do you have to go around to every city i guess you have to uh, but I asked that question not, you know, a matter of fact, more of a, do you really have to? I mean, can we can we skip some cities here? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's some good venues here to go see a ball game. But I hate the fact that we had to wait this long to get the game back at Dodgers Stadium. All right, when we continue, we're going to turn our attention to football. We'll be speaking with Dave Cohen. He's the play-by-play voice of Georgia State. Looking forward to it when we continue on this edition of The Drive. Do you like the show and you want to make your own? Well, let me tell you about Anchor. It's free. They're creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And now you can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create. Now, Anchor is going to distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast. No minimum listenership needed. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to the Wednesday edition. The Drive continues here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. I want to welcome to the program now. He is the play-by-play voice of Georgia State. And the Thundering Herd will be finishing out the regular season with Georgia State. The Panthers are coming to Huntington to uh, get ready for, I, I hope it's going to be a great game. And Dave is with us on the program now. Dave Cohen, play-by-play voice of the Georgia State Panthers. Thanks for doing it, Dave. I appreciate you spending some time and uh, talking a little uh, Marshall and Georgia State football with us. Hey, I appreciate it. Good to be on with you guys and looking forward to uh, getting back up to uh, Huntington, West Virginia. It's going to be fun. Um, We were talking about the game uh, just a little bit before uh, you came on, and 
Yeah, I think this is a team that might – I don't think you're going to sneak up on anybody for sure. If you have a, a good start to the season like you had a finish, uh, this might be a team we better be talking about as far as contending for the uh, at least a championship in the Sun Belt. Well, again, it will be interesting. I was telling someone earlier today that, uh, you know, we, Georgia State, we've got to navigate, you know, the first half of the season, which – if you don't have it in front of you, we open up September 3 at South Carolina. Then the next Saturday, we're at home against North Carolina. And then it's Charlotte Week 3, and they're no one to overlook. And then Coastal Carolina, you know, 11-2 and two a year ago, uh, Week 4. And then we're on the road at Army Week 5 before Georgia Southern comes in Week 6. And no matter how good or bad Georgia State or Georgia Southern are, that's, you know, that's our rivalry game. So, it's uh, you know, it's what I call a football minefield, right from the opening kick, uh, September the three, on a Saturday night in Columbia, South Carolina. But it's uh, you know, it's a good football program. It's going into its thirteenth season, so still, you know, the overall scheme of things, relatively young. But I think finally, uh, after the way they finished last year, they've got their feet on the ground. It's a solid foundation that Sean Elliott has built. We got a lot of experience coming back, and I know they're looking forward to it after uh, the way they finished up last season. Yeah, it was a great finish. Uh, I want to backtrack just a little bit because you are obviously well versed in Georgia Southern football, and just that's a team you want to get after. And as a Marshall fan who can remember back in the days of the Southern Conference, that was a team I wanted to see Marshall get after as well. Uh, how big is that rivalry between Georgia State and Georgia Southern? Is I mean, is is it growing? Is it is it always been there, and we're just seeing it being played now more? Talk to me about that. Well, it really went to a different level when we added football back in you know 2010. For years, we were in the same league together. You know, in the old Transamerica Athletic Conference, which now is known as the Atlantic Sun, but, you know, at its highest level, it was men's and women's basketball and maybe a little bit with regards to a rivalry in college baseball, which they've always been pretty good at. But, you know, the rivalry really went to another level, as you might imagine, when we added football. And, you know, the first time we played them in the in the old Georgia Dome, I think it was 69-31, they came in and really demolished us uh, in the first game. And, you know, they were calling, their fans were calling, you know, the Georgia Dome, which of course doesn't stand anymore. It's Mercedes-Benz Stadium right next to it. But, you know, they were calling the Georgia Dome Paulson Stadium North. And, you know, so right from the get-go, they lobbed a grenade in the gasoline can and, and the football rivalry was, was off and running. And so what happened, you know, in 2015, we go down to Statesboro, we're five and six, we've never been to a bowl game, and we absolutely destroyed them at Paulson Stadium. 34-7, their worst loss ever in the history of Paulson Stadium, from what I was told. And for us, it was the sixth win. We were bowl eligible, and we ended up going to the first Auto Nation Cure Bowl down in Orlando against San Jose State, which we ended up losing that game. But, you know, we really won the season, you know, a few weeks prior by going down to Statesboro, avenging the loss in Atlanta, delivering what, what was the worst loss in program history in Statesboro, and for us, becoming bowl eligible on the field in Statesboro. And, you know, since then, we lead the series with them. I think we've played them seven or eight times now, and I think we've won four or five of them. So we're, I think we're two games ahead of them in the all-time series, which I know drives them crazy because of all their success at the FCS level, which I give them total credit for and total respect. But it's a little different now since they've come to the Sun Belt Conference we're in the Sun Belt Conference, and both football teams, you know, have grown, gotten better, and become more accustomed to playing what we'll call Sun Belt level football. And that's the story I keep hearing as far as these exciting matchups. And when it was announced that Marshall would join the Sun Belt along with Old Dominion, you also have Southern Miss and you have JMU. You know, what was the reaction from you and Georgia State fans with the additions, which? It seems like it makes perfect sense with these additions, and the geography is great, and these kind of rivalries and stories can grow and, and build and continue. No question about it, and I'm sure you've seen it like I have in some of the national news stories. Oh, the Sun Belt East is, you know, the best G5, uh, you know, league or G5 
uh, conference in the country, not only just the Sun Belt, but more specifically the Sun Belt East. I mean, geez, look at it. I mean, it's Appalachian State. You know, they were 10 and 4 last year. It's Coastal Carolina. They were 11 and 2. We had our best season winning eight. Uh, like I said, Georgia Southern's Georgia Southern. James Madison was one of the best. FCS programs last year. I watched them in the uh, the FCS playoffs. They won 12 games. Marshall is always tough. I think I saw the the, Mar- the Thundering Herd in, in Appalachian State. Uh, I think they played that game last year in, in uh, Boone, if I remember correctly. And then Old Dominion comes in, and they were six and seven. But we played them in James Madison before when we were in the old in the uh, Colonial Athletic Association. So, yeah, the Sun Belt East is is. No joke. I mean, it's a total beast, and um, you know we've yet to beat Appalachian State yet in football. We've come close a couple of times, and it's been ugly a couple of times. But uh, we beat Coastal Carolina in a shootout last year over in uh, Conway, 42-40. But Grayson McCall is back. He didn't play in that game. So again, with with App State and Coastal and Marshall and Georgia Southern, Georgia State, JMU, and Old Dominion, it, it's there, it, the Sun Belt East is absolutely no joke. Best, uh, best division in G five football, I'd say right now. And this, this conference also seems to have a lot of good running backs. Uh, we get the list today for the Doak Walker, Rasheen Ali is obviously on it. He's outstanding for Marshall. But you've got a couple of running backs that are on the list as well, and that was one of the hallmarks of this team last year. Really good running. You know, I always remind Sean Elliott when we do interviews where we're talking about the run game, I remind him of the very first interview we did the day he was hired in the Georgia State Student Center Auditorium where the news conference took place, and he flat out told me, because we had struggled to run the football in the early days of the program, you know, two years of FCS Independent, one year in the Colonial, and then we jumped right into the Sun Belt, which, you know, to be honest, we weren't ready for, but the door opened and we had to go. Um, but Coach Elliott said, look, we're going to run the football. And, um, you know, he has certainly backed that up. And, you know, the story of these two guys, uh, the Doak Walker candidates that you mentioned, Tucker Gregg and Jemias Williams, two really good stories. I mean, you got Tucker Gregg, who's a walk-on originally, scholarship now, but he was originally a walk-on like eighth or ninth on the depth chart. He's out of Chatsworth, Georgia. And, boy, he has really, really put his mark in this program. He's climbed up the depth chart where he's the number – he and Jemias are the number one guys. It's really Batman and Robin, you know, for lack of a better term. I guess I would put Tucker one, Jemias two. But any week of the season it could flip. Uh, But, you know, the two of them combined for 18 touchdowns last year. Tucker rushed for 953 yards, Jemias for 859. Jemias averages almost seven yards a rush. Tucker's a little over five per carry. Um, You know, they have really, really held down the run game and and made it what it is. And, you know, a lot of the credit, as you might imagine, goes to our offensive line as well. We're only losing one offensive lineman who's going to hopefully make the Seattle Seahawks. The other four guys are all super experienced. So with an experienced quarterback who can run, and Darren Granger, he was our third leading rusher, you know, we've got Greg, we've got Julius Williams, and we've got Darren Granger. All three can run the football, um, you know, really well on any given day behind what is one of the more experienced offensive lines. But, yeah, Greg's a good story as a wa- as originally a walk-on. And Jemias Williams, I failed to mention, originally was – he was a DB at the University of South Carolina before transferring to Georgia State. He gets here, and they start him out on defense. They eventually switch him to offense, and now he's, he's one of our top two running backs. My guest, the voice of Georgia State, Dave Cohen, the – Final game of the regular season will be on November 26th. It'll be Marshall playing host to Georgia State. We've been talking about that offense and that run game. Uh, As far as uh, the wide receiver threats are concerned, the passing attack, obviously this is a a run-first team, but uh, how capable do you think the passing attack is going to be this year? Well, I think it'll be very capable, and I say that even though off of last year's team, Going into last season, our top two receivers were Cornelius McCoy, 
who has since transferred to the University of Tennessee at Martin, and Sam Pinckney, who has since transferred to Coastal Carolina. Uh, but our top guys return. Jamari Thrash caught 32 balls, three touchdowns a year ago. Jakaius Cradle transferred from the University of Central Florida, 21 catches, three touchdowns. Um, the best story is Aubrey Payne, our tight end. You know, when we were leaving Montgomery, Alabama last year after beating Ball State in the um, in the Camellia Bowl, the only place we found to eat on the way home was in Auburn, Alabama at a Waffle House. And the radio crew parks, we walk in, and there's Aubrey with his fiance and his parents sitting at the booth. And so we exchanged pleasantries, and I honestly thought that it was the last time that Aubrey Payne would play for Georgia State, and he had a great game against Ball State. I don't know, a few weeks later, a month and a half later, we find out that uh, he's going to get a seventh year of eligibility. So Aubrey Payne married now um, and graduated now, he's a grad student, is going to come back and play his seventh season of uh, football. Now, he has not spent all seven here. He transferred to Georgia State after starting his collegiate career in Cullowee, North Carolina at Western Carolina. But a really, really good story uh, in that he did get awarded the seventh year, and he's going to stick around and play another season of Georgia State football. So between Thrash, Jakaias Cradle, Aubrey Payne, uh, I would say with a few other guys there at four, five, and six in the depth chart, we look pretty good when it comes to delivering the ball through the air. How do you feel about the defense this year? What's uh, what's the story there? Because it feels like the running game, as we talked about, a lot of that gets more of the national attention. You know, How do you feel about this team's defense? Well, actually, I feel pretty good about it, and here's why. And I know that what happened last year happened last year. But last year, they set a school record, 38 sacks, 92 tackles for loss. They intercepted 11 footballs. And a bulk of those guys returned. Thomas Gore uh, and Jeffrey Clark along the defensive line. Uh, Gore had 45 tackles, 10 for loss. A really good story is Jamil Muhammad as an outside, you know, one of, I guess you would call him a bandit. Um, but he had six sacks, six tackles for loss. And his story is he transferred to Georgia State, what, three years ago after starting his collegiate career in Nashville as a quarterback at Vanderbilt. He transfers to Georgia State, comes in as a quarterback. Everybody thinking, I thought that, you know, here comes a kid from Vanderbilt. You know, granted, it's in the SEC. And I'm like, he's going to give our starter a good run for his money with regards to to try to get that starting job. Well, by the time the smoke cleared, they'd moved him to defense, and he has been on a couple of different positions uh, defensively, but now with that outside linebacker, again, rush bandit spot, he has really found his home on the defensive side of the football uh, for Georgia State. And then, again, solid in the, uh, in the, in the, the backfield with the corners. Uh, you know, I mean, with the safeties, Antavius Lane, who had 82 tackles and five interceptions last year. And then jumping back in the middle, extremely experienced, uh, two guys that were taken to uh, one guy, one of them were taken to Sunbelt Conference Media Day, Blake Carroll, um, 11.5 tackles for loss, six sacks. And then, uh, again, Robin to Batman, Jordan Venzial, 97 tackles. He was our leading tackler last year, eight tackles for loss, four sacks. So along the defensive line, in the middle with those linebackers and, you know, a guy like uh, Jamil Muhammad uh, on the outside, and, you know, again, one or two other pieces. And then Antavius Lane kind of anchoring, uh, you know, the, the, uh, from the safety position there in the middle. I feel really good about Georgia State's defense. Again, South Carolina, North Carolina, Coastal Carolina, Army, Georgia Southern, Appalachian State, so on and so forth. That's all, those are a lot of good football teams that we're playing this year. There's there's barely a game on there that I look at and I say, okay, I, I think we can pencil in a win in that one. I, I don't see many games on our schedule that I feel like I could do that for. I was trying to do the very same thing earlier with the Marshall schedule. I can't there's not a gimme on the Sun Belt schedule. And of course the great thing for you is if you've if you like the state of North Carolina or you know I mean you're you're gonna be entertaining a, a lot of Carolina fans uh here. You you 
I mean, South Carolina, North Carolina, Charlotte, Coastal Carolina. I mean, basically, uh, for the first month of football, it's it's Georgia State versus Carolina, and you can't get it wrong. And this will be the first time that we host a Power Five uh, at Center Park uh, Credit Union Stadium. So I'm sure there will be a lot of Tar Heel blue in the stadium that day, but hopefully we'll have a lot of Georgia State blue in there as well. And look, you know, in 2019, I I remember making the drive up to Knoxville. uh, No expectations. We ended up shocking Tennessee, which, you know, for the first time really kind of put Georgia State football on the map nationally and kind of made people take a second look at what Sean Elliott is doing here at Georgia State. And, you know, what a great story it would be for Coach Elliott who played at Appalachian State, but prior to coming to Georgia State, was on Steve Spurrier's staff at South Carolina, and then was the interim head coach when, if you remember, Spurrier stepped down midseason. Well, now Coach Elliott goes back as the head coach at Georgia State with a pretty good football team. It would make for a great story. My guest is Dave Cohen. He's play-by-play voice of Georgia State. Before I let you go, I'm just kind of curious because it's going to be a while before Marshall fans can actually come and see a game at Georgia State. We've got a year to go, but what's game day going to be like for Herd fans when they finally get that, make that trip down? Well, some of your fans may remember how to get there because, you know, Georgia State purchased uh, the former home of the Atlanta Braves, Turner Field, and converted it to Center Park Stadium. So um, anybody that wants to take a look at it can go to georgiastatesports.com, and I'm sure they'll find a photo or two of what it looks like. But, you know, when the Braves left, just to give you a brief bit of history, one of the things they wanted was the opportunity to build kind of like an entertainment district, which is what they've done at the Battery just up Interstate 75. They didn't want to do it for whatever reason, and I don't know all the negotiating factors there, but... Georgia State and their development partner have managed to do that. Just up the street, we're about to open up the 8,000-seat Georgia State Convocation Center. Uh, Restaurants are opening just outside the stadium to the right in the Summerhill section. They're building student housing down here right across the street. The public shopping center is under construction. And for your older fans who remember the first home of the Atlanta Braves Center um, in uh, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, well, that's a parking lot. Georgia State owns that property and is going to build a baseball and softball uh, complex on that site, hopefully sooner than later. So they're going to find, hopefully in a year, there'll be a lot more progress done. They're going to find kind of, I'm not going to call it an entertainment district, but we'll call it an athletic and student living district uh, surrounded by some retail and restaurants and and so on and so forth, which is a stark contrast uh, to what the area was during the time that the Atlanta Braves played there. And and prior to that, remember, it was originally uh, built as Olympic Stadium for the 1996 Summer Olympic Games. So Georgia State has this stadium in its third life and uh, is is doing a fantastic job building up around it um, and and creating an area where, you know, people want to come and enjoy a game day atmosphere uh, outside the stadium. And there's a lot, there'll hopefully be a lot to do. Well, I know it's going to be a year before it happens, but I'm sure a lot of Herd fans are excited. And it's an easy trip. You're going somewhere where it's easy to get to. Everybody knows how to get there. And, of course, you're right, a lot of a lot of Brave fans, even in the state of West Virginia, so they know how to get there. I'm sure going back to the old days of TBS and, uh, you know, the Braves, I guess the Cubs on WGN were the only two teams that were seen nationally. Before the days of uh, what we have now, you know, with regards to uh, televised and broadcast sports, you know, back in the day, you'd find Braves fans from here to Alaska. So it's, it was all built on the power of Ted Turner and, and uh, you know, the, the reach of TBS. You know, those days are gone, per se, you know, like it was then. But there were Atlanta Braves fans all over the place, and I know there still are. Well, if, yeah, for fans that date back a little bit, you know, TBS at the time was great because you could you could watch the Braves, America's team, the Braves, and a lot of fans, of course, uh, especially around here, would stick around, you know, for Georgia Championship Wrestling 
in the day as well on TBS. And you, know, you would tune in, you would hear uh, the voice of Tony Schiavone, and of course you'd watch all you know the classic wrestling matches with Gordon Soley. And uh, it well, yes, TBS. Yeah, there are a lot of Braves fans here because of TBS. Yeah, Braves Championship Wrestling and the Andy Griffith Show. Yes, you're three for three. Dave, thanks for doing this. I appreciate you giving us sort of a little insight on what we can expect with Georgia State. I'm excited for the game coming up. Uh, it'll be a great way to end the regular season and uh, looking forward to getting you here in Huntington. And uh, this will be a great relationship for years to come, I hope. Yeah, I was telling Christian uh, via email last time I was in Huntington, um, you know, before Georgia State had football, of course, I was here doing basketball and baseball. But uh, through a friend of mine, I was on the Furman University radio network on weekends, and we made that long trip up to uh, Huntington uh, back in the days of uh, Furman. And, well, Furman's still in the Southern Conference, but uh, when Marshall was in the SOCON, and uh, who was it, Pennington? Chad Pennington was the quarterback, and um, Randy Moss was the receiver. I guess he had just transferred in from Florida State, so. It was a long day for Furman. It was a long drive up and a long drive back, but uh, that is my lasting memory of uh, the last time I was in Huntington, West Virginia. If you're a Herd fan, that was a great memory. Uh, if you were a Herd fan, <laughs> it was a great memory. Hey, Marsha was really, really good that year. I do, I do remember that. That that yeah, I remember that game well. Yeah, I uh, because I was not a Furman. You're kidding. I, you know, I grew up at the Southern Conference, so you know all the teams in, in the Southern Conference. You know, I was against. So that was definitely one of my favorites. Dave, thanks for doing it. I can't wait to get you back here in Huntington. Uh, we look forward to your visit, and uh, this was great. And I hope we can do it again soon. As always, I appreciate it, and uh, great to be on with you. Looking forward to Marshall now uh, being a member of the Sun Belt. Again, looking forward to get up to Huntington there in late November. Outstanding. Thanks, Dave. We appreciate it. Dave Cohen, our guest. When we continue, we're going to talk a little baseball action. We've got Lindsey Webb coming up from the Charleston Dirty Birds. She's standing by. We'll talk to her when we continue on this edition of The Drive. We're taking Paul Swan everywhere. Download or subscribe to The Drive with Paul Swan on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Wednesday edition. It is Wednesday, so you, you know what that means. That It means it's time for Lindsey Webb from the Charleston Dirty Birds. I know, I changed it up a little bit on you this time. I'm throwing your whole day off not doing it uh, earlier today. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. How you been? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. I'm good. Uh, I'm excited because uh, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, I've already seen the shirt for the Corey Bird Final game, the Bird 37 shirt. Just add that to the list of things I want. Yes. I don't know how you're going to ship all this stuff I, I actually want, but uh, hope, just, you know what, send an intern down with a care package if you would. There we go. The next time I'm down your way, I'll just, I'll, I can just bring it. I like it. I like it. Lindsay Webb's my guest, uh, the director of marketing from the Charleston Dirty Bird. I'm just shortening your title, director of marketing. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, do we want to talk about the loss last night? The Dirty Birds lost six to four to the Lancaster Barnstormers. Do we want to talk about that? You know, there's not much to talk about, okay. but we can talk about it. Okay. <laughs> they lost, uh, but they get a chance. Yeah, to, they, they get a chance to go at them again today. So uh, there you go. There's an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're you know they're out here. They're they're doing doing what they can. We have so many guys that are injured right now and trying to figure out, you know, whether they're going to physical therapy and getting better or it just seems like every game somebody's getting hurt. So we're trying to figure out how to prevent injury right now. It's like one of those things you can't control, but it feels like half our team is some way or shape, form, banged up a little bit. How much of that is a different array of players uh, always being signed? You have players that are – you know, trying to get back to the show. You have players that are close to getting to the show. You have players that, you know, different trajectories there. Uh, how hard is that to manage? Because I'm sure you have different levels of, you have a lot of maybe experienced players, older players, younger players. I mean, it's it's a, like any Major League Baseball team, you know, you have a diverse lineup, but it, it probably feels like you have a, a much more, a variety of ages, uh, all shapes and sizes when it comes to, you know, baseball uh, 
trying to get back to the show. Yeah, and it seems like, I mean, our team is still pretty young, but their age doesn't, you know, really matter that much because our guys, most of our guys have been playing since they were like, you know, right out of high school, right out of college. So they have like 10, 15 years of baseball under their belt. And I just think people don't realize what that does to your body. Like you don't necessarily have to have some sort of like ligament tear or something like that, just constantly throwing a baseball 70 to 90 miles an hour that that wears your body down so and you know like when when we get these guys they come in they have to pass physical but if they don't have any like real serious injuries they could pass physical but then you know they're just really worn down so we're we're resting some guys and rehabbing some guys so hopefully we'll hopefully we'll have a healthy team here soon Let's talk about some additions that were made to the team. Uh, let's start. Uh, you you talk about pitching. Always need pitching. And so, uh, Luis Cruz uh, just signed him. What can you tell us? Yeah, so he is a starting pitcher, which is awesome. We definitely need starting pitchers. It seems like most of our pitchers are used to being relievers, so they're not used to going five innings. They're only used to throwing, you know, one, two, three innings at a time. But – with the experimental rule that we have, you lose. So if you don't, if your starting pitcher doesn't go five innings, then you lose your designated hitter for the rest of the game. So when we're throwing up relievers, it's really hard for them to to go those five innings. So then we end up losing our designated hitter. So we're really trying to prevent that. So getting just a starting pitcher to begin with is going to be really awesome for us. But on top of that, he was in Mexico. He was playing for the Mexican League and. Um, the Mexican League is just like they're so good over there. It's super competitive, and he was doing really well over there. But you know, he decided to come back and come over to the states and play. And a lot of teams were looking at him, and they were fighting for him. And for whatever reason, maybe once he gets here, I'll ask him. He decided to come play for the Dirty Birds, so we're really excited about that. It's always good when you kind of like win over. Uh, a guy that everyone's kind of looking at and trying to get them to come, get him to come there. But yeah, so we're really excited about him. Also, an addition and a familiar face coming back to the team this time. Um, hopefully, you can keep him for a little bit longer. Uh, Edwin Espinel is returning to the roster. Obviously, for long term uh, Charleston baseball fans. You know him. He played uh, for the Power when the team was in the South Atlantic League and then played for the Dirty Birds in 2021. So here he is again. And uh, what's the journey look like this time for him back to the Dirty Birds? Yeah, so he played our entire 2021 season with us. And, I mean, I don't have his splash lineup right in front of me right now, but, you know, he was he was doing great. He, he played really well for us. He was one of our key players. Um, last season and you know he was on the team that that went to the playoffs so he's the first baseman and he's just he can absolutely destroy baseball so that's going to be really awesome for us and he's a fan favorite he's like super silly he you know he'll hit a single and get to first base and then just start dancing like he's just an all-around awesome guy the fans love him just because he's entertaining and he's a really good baseball player so I think having those two guys on our roster is going to be a really key part in us getting to the playoffs. If, you know, if we can get there, I think they're going to be a really big key part. My guest is Lindsay Webb, marketing director for the Charleston Dirty Birds. Let's talk marketing. We mentioned the Corey Bird t-shirt giveaway. It's the last game of his career. He is retiring and he's going to retire as a Dirty Bird. So you've got the shirt giveaway and uh, how many, do you have how soon the fans need to be there? Because I'm sure a lot of Marshall fans will uh, will descend upon the stadium to get that shirt. Yeah, he, you know, Corey, he's a local guy. He's also a great guy. He went to Herbert Hoover High School, which is right here in Charleston. And then he went to Marshall and played for them and then, you know, went straight into affiliated ball. So people love him, especially around here. He really has that community tie. Um, we're doing his t-shirt it'll gates will open at 5 30 
but people will definitely be in line way before 5.30. I always tell people if you want to make sure you get a shirt, you better get there early um, because our giveaways have just been flying out the gate this season. Um, And the first 1,000 fans inside the ballpark will get that T-shirt. So get there early, only 1,000. I'm sorry, 999 because Lindsay's (laughs) pulling mine up, pulling mine I'm not going to see one. I know. There's not going to be enough. I'm not going to see one. I'm okay with that, Lindsay. I'm, I'm okay with that. As long as I get my Mothman stuff, I'm happy. There you go. Fireworks on Saturday, uh, Faith and Family Night. Uh, so uh, there will be some discounts for uh, churches, group ticket discounts there. Uh, we talked about the crazy hot dog vendor is going to be there. And – I think we can't forget, hopefully the crazy hot dog vendor will take care of Steve Blass. Uh, he's going to be there signing autographs, and he's going to be inducted into the Charleston Baseball Wall of Fame. So for Pittsburgh Pirates fans, Steve Blass, that's going to be a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So he's going to be there. We're going to um, induct him into the our Wall of Fame that's in the ballpark. We're going to induct him pregame. Um, and then he's going to be signing autographs as soon as they're done with the, the induction. He's going to go up and sign autographs until 8 o'clock. So from what I've heard, I haven't met him yet, but I've just heard that he's just so nice, like such a great guy. So fans will be able to go up, and I think he's bringing some of his baseball cards. So they'll be able to get baseball cards signed and get pictures with him. So I think the Pirates fans will be really excited about that. Sounds like it's going to be a fun one. And of course on Sunday, you've got the photo player giveaway day and uh, help me with the pronunciation. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce Nick's last name. I'm not going to attempt it. It's that's what I have you here for Lindsay. <laughs> yeah. So it's Nick Longy. Longy. Okay. I just want to make sure I don't want to butcher Longy. it. Yeah. I don't want to butcher his name. Yeah, no, that's fair. We've had, I mean, at the beginning of the season, a lot of visiting broadcasters, even though that I include a pronunciation guide on our roster, um, not everybody's always looking for that. So we had a lot of people mispronounce his name, Long High, Long He, uh, everything you can think of. But yes, it is Nick Longy. He's our first baseman and he is our player photo series giveaway this week on Sunday. Okay, so busy uh, busy weekend for the Charleston Dirty Birds, and we'll get you back here next week to talk about everything that's coming up, including replica hat giveaway that's coming up, the fireworks, of course, and uh, there'll be another inductee into the Charleston Baseball Wall of Fame. So we've got all of that coming up, and we'll do it again with you next week. Uh, have a fun, fun few days at the ballpark. Uh, we'll get you back on earlier next week. I, I will do better. Sounds great. I'll, I'll, I'll make it Sounds work great. better. Hey, you're a busy man, I understand. I'm just I'm trying to make everybody happy. I don't do a good job of it. You know, there's so many people I gotta make happy. Uh but as long as you're happy, I'm good, Lindsay. Oh, I'm I am beyond happy. Lindsay Webb, the director of marketing for the Charleston Dirty Birds. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you so much. We'll talk next week. That's Lindsay Webb. We'll wrap it up when we continue with this edition of The Drive on ESPN ninety four point one and A of nine thirty. This is The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. We're wrapping up today's edition of The Drive. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Paul Swan, here on ESPN 94.1 and AM 930. A couple of news and notes to talk to you about from the Cincinnati Bengals. The 2022 Ring of Honor class named today and... Willie Anderson and Isaac Curtis are going to be added to the team's ring of honor in this upcoming season. Last season, the inaugural class had Ken Anderson, Paul Brown, Anthony Munoz, and Ken Riley. So the ring of honor continues to grow. And thankfully, the Bengals are finally doing a ring of honor for some of the all-time greats. And speaking of... The team founder and head coach, Paul Brown. There could be a naming deal coming soon for the stadium. It's been forever Paul Brown Stadium. Cincinnati is one of three teams, I believe, that do not have a naming deal in place. And the Cincinnati Enquirer is reporting that the team hopes to have a deal in place before the start of the season. So cities already been notified, county officials, because of course you know the partnership. Yeah, you have to um, you have to realize there's a lot of untapped potential for money and revenue when it comes to a naming deal, 
And there's been a lot of improvements and a lot of facility upgrades to uh, Paul Brown Stadium. They're not done yet. They're actually putting some more you know, into the stadium because it was a it was a, it's not a non-traditional stadium really. It's one of those postmodern designs of stadiums and I think it's a, it looks great to this day. I mean, you can look at some of the, the newer modern stadiums with, you know, scoreboards that uh, you know encircle the entire upper atmosphere of the of the stadium. But for an outdoor football stadium, I think Paul Brown Stadium is a fantastic facility. So they're also working on their practice bubble, trying to get that constructed. And they don't have a practice bubble. When I would go to Cincinnati to there, there would have a, a a day where I could come up, and there wasn't a practice bubble there at all. You're just, you, you know, you're practicing on some grass fields right next to Paul Brown Stadium. So I think a facility is going to definitely help. It's going to help with free agency. It's going to help with you know your team, and you don't have to worry about practicing and you know bad conditions. I mean, the whole point of practicing is to to get ready. And you don't want to fight the elements. I mean, you got to play in the elements, but you don't want to fight the elements as well. So uh, there could be a naming rights deal in place here, uh, and there could be uh, some more improvements coming. Uh, again, you have three stadiums. You have Paul Brown, and you have Green Bay, and you have Chicago. So those are the three that don't have naming right deals. There's some... I'm wondering what the thinking here is going to be. You know, will you keep Paul Brown Stadium in the name? Because that's a pretty big deal there. I mean, it's Paul Brown Stadium. You know, he's the he's the founder. Basically, he's the founder of pro football in the state of Ohio. You know, he had his you know, had his beta team there. You know, when he was beta testing football with the Browns, and then he got the the, the right version finished in Cincinnati. Yeah, I'm trolling you, Browns fans. You know I am. So that's interesting. Could it be a sp- could it be Heinz Field at Paul Brown Stadium? Imagine that. Could it be Heinz Field? Could we have the catch-up? Could the catch-up bottles went down from Heinz Field? Could the catch-up bottles be heading right now to Paul Brown Stadium? Could we put the catch-up bottles up at Paul Brown Stadium? I mean, that would be a great way to troll Steelers fans who are losing their marbles over the naming. It's a name. It's going to change three more times before you die, probably. That's the deal. I mean, college stadiums, some are going to get naming rights here. Before before it's all said and done, I won't be surprised if Joan C. Edwards Stadium gets a naming deal. Get some new money in. Have an opportunity there. Sure, you, you appreciate everything that Joan C. Edwards did for Marshall and was able to do for the university, but there's a source of revenue there. Yeah, You give a gift in perpetuity. I mean, on one hand, you want to honor somebody in perpetuity, but the other hand, athletic department is looking for money. It's tough. It really is. I mean, could the Cam Henderson Center be seeing a name change here? You know, maybe not as much as basketball, football, but we'll see. It's a possibility. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for tuning in. Back tomorrow here on ESPN 94.1 in AM 930. WRBC Huntington, W227BS Huntington, your flagship home of the Marshall Thundering Herd and The Drive with Paul Swan, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930.